I'm Catherine Clinton. It deepens my morning that I discussed this event with Carol Blesser, who is sadly no longer with us, but she was bowed low by the loss of her friend, Jean Genovese. And we spoke about this tribute to Bert and what I should be saying last spring. I volunteer for it to be a great pleasure to be able to reflect on the pathbreaking career of Wyatt Brown, most particularly Southern Honor, to which I owe a deep and complicated debt. And I'm sure many of us here in this room might feel equally beholden. When I began to explore Southern history, the field was full of treacherous terrain, rabbit holes, very challenging to a neophyte scholar, and Bert was very much the white rabbit for those of us lucky enough to follow him if we wanted to go on a great adventure. Serious analysis of gender prior to the 1970s was missing in action. Women, especially those just granted admission to elite previously all-male enclaves, were, express, were expected to suppress gender thoughts, not to act on them as our rashes might produce unwanted results. We became barbarians at the doorbell, politely ringing, hoping to be let in. I encountered Bert early in my career when he was a visiting fellow at the Davis Center at Princeton in 1977-78. He looked forward to sharing a chapter from what would become his signal contribution. The seminar was presided over by Lawrence Stone, commented on by Drew Faust, and the ensuing debate became legendary, like much associated with Bert's style and the substance of formidable scholarship. And this episode was something he would return to again and again in imitable uh, BWB style, placing himself at the center of a hubbub, just as often at the crossroads. His career spanned five tumultuous decades, and his legions of students are testimony to depth and breadth. He confided to me in a phone call shortly before his death that he considered his greatest legacy to be his PhDs. The fest trip, the book launches, especially the one at the SHA, celebrated Bert's remarkable role as a mentor. Perhaps it is because he himself was enthralled by the previous generation and his Woodwardian upbringing. Bert dedicated his formidable energies to leading postgraduates onto the field, arms akimbo, dripping in chain mail. If I would be at a conference where one of his ducklings was delivering an essay, a phone call or email would ensue, matching, mentoring, friendship flowing. He adored the Bert Fest, his former student staged in Gainesville. Southern Honor remains a remarkable book in many ways, with an important and distinctive edge in the deluge of good work in the 70s and 80s. His magisterial project developed when Southern Studies was engulfed by a really amazing competition of, of wonderful volumes, and there was a scrimmage of scholars who were trying to wrest the title away from the retiring generation, and it was amazingly combative. Duels not at 20 paces, but more in your face. The SHA was a very popular venue for these kinds of gladiatorial contests, replete with scorched earth and pierced armor. As Bert finished his honor opus, he dared to include women, and not just to include them, but to foreground sexuality in his ambitious book. Women graduate students, women historical actors, women colleagues, his wife and fellow scholar Anne, all may have had a strong influence, but whatever the causation, it allowed a sea change, especially during these very difficult navigational times. Let's not forget Carl Degler, the riverboat gambler, who was joined by a dandy in a bow tie, BWB, in the 1980s. And it's my contention that Southern Honor was the first modern work by a non-female, non-women's history scholar to place women and sexuality on the agenda. Sex is a verb rather than a category. Keeping in mind sexuality then was something women scholars might fail to mention, a lot less prioritize. BWB was not only willing and able to confront gender and sex, but he relished his status, bubbling with enthusiastic rock contourship, a mesmerizing stylist, and a not so closeted romantic. He headed down to Florida, building Burt World in the Tropics, a visionary storyteller, and I never tired of hearing his rendition of the night. Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath met. It always began in Cambridge on that memorable afternoon in 56, 
Bert would become a character in the drama, the novel life he led, sometimes rainy, sometimes not, a young man in a hurry on a bike, running into the wave, inviting her to a party, she who would become the Sylvia Plath, we may have all known and loved in our youth. But how many of you sitting out there read the bell jar? The ones who counted, Bert well knew. The ones who would respond to their students' gendered psychosexual perspectives, blossoming in this era, seeing the way in which we are formed by our families and aspirations, our dreams, our rejections, and especially sense memories, being suffused with the stuff of who we are and try as many might, we cannot delude ourselves that we ever left home, a lot less can't go there again. With grudging and much gratitude, I came to admire the goofy, generous spirit, spirit which led BWB to dance across the minefield, where the explosive topics of sex and madness might be avoided or skipped, but if encountered, created a bang. Bert wrestled with race, status, class, mentalité, and yes, honor. Positioning himself within a very cerebral, char sharply angled realm of Southern intellectual history. Such a cool field. Remaining a relatively hot headed interrogator, and when overheated, BWB would demand in his distinctive whine that you debate him. Then he would release a kind of laughter, a, a unique chortle, really, which made it pleasant as well as illuminating to exchange with someone so genial while at the same time so baffled that you did not share his views. When discussing matters of shame, pain, and humiliation, the bravado and genius came shining through. Blood and guts was just fodder for someone like Bert. He was in many ways a throwback to the Cavalier, but instead of mounting the barricades and the feathered hat, sword, sword drawn, he, he would drop his weapon and wheel around and confront his comrades getting them to excavate their own motives and meanings in contests of revisionism. He alighted into grandiosity in the most engaging offhand manner and basked in praise and appreciation even as he continued to carp at the world wanting more and giving less. And my most vivid memory, very fond of Bert, is associated with this organization when he was president and I came to town early to help with local arrangements which that year was in New Orleans, and so it included, of course, chasing down a small parasol so that Bert could have the proper accessory to lead the second line parade through the quarter. And his role in the parade and celebration remains one of my fondest memories of how this organization brings people together. While Bert was amongst us, we reaped the rewards of his sufferings and his sacrifices. <clears throat> which ensured it was not necessary to carve down others in size to increase our own stature. We are the poorer for his passing, we're the richer for having known him as we gather to mourn and celebrate.